Good morning from D.C. and welcome. Thanks to everybody for joining us today for this webinar. Um, the, the topic is Enabling the Business of Agriculture, and it's my pleasure to, to introduce it. I'm Kelly Cormier. I'm with USAID's Bureau for Food Security in the Office of Market and Partnership Innovations, and I work in support of the Feed the Future initiative. USAID's involvement with agricultural benchmarking began um, under the Enabling Agricultural Trade Project and the Agri uh, Index work that was piloted in 10 of the Feed the Future countries. This served as proof of concept, and the research and practical lessons learned informed the design of the Enabling the Business of um, Agriculture project. USAID saw the opportunity to scale up uh, this agricultural benchmarking work with the 2012 G8 call for a comparative tool that benchmarks agribusiness leaders. We joined other donors to support the World Bank to develop the EBA and see it as an important tool in helping Feed the Future to monitor progress in the, enabling, um, in the agribusiness enabling environment of Feed the Future countries. Currently, the EBA covers 14 Feed the Future countries. It will cover 18 by uh, 2016 into 2016-2017, um, and it, it will cover all new alliance countries. So it's important to note that it's avail it will be available in almost every Feed the Future um, country. Over the next one and a half hours, you'll learn about the EBA tool, its underlying methodology, and its potential uses. And as you'll hear, the EBA tool is still under development, and it will be expanding in technical scope and in geographic coverage. The World Bank EBA team and BFS very much want to hear from you to better understand how this tool can be improved. And during the Q&A, we're very interested in hearing from you about, in particular, how relevant are the topics and findings to your country context? How do you see this as potentially useful in your work? What would make it better? What do you wish was covered that you haven't seen today? And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speakers. Um, Farbad Yousafi and Federica Saliola are, are uh, colleagues that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, since the start of the project in 2012. They are with the World Bank Group. Uh, Federica is with the Global Indicators um, Group. And this group focuses on um, developing benchmarks. Um, it's, a, it's the think tank um, 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 part of the World Bank. And, and, it, it, and some of the, uh, the analyses that you might be familiar with include the Doing Business Index. So Federica comes with a lot of experience from that um, part of the World Bank group. Farbad Yousafi is from the Agriculture Global Practice, where, um, where he and colleagues focus on value chains and post-harvest sy systems. Um, among other topics, and brings that practical experience. And one of the things that I think all of us working on the EBA at its beginning um, realized is that this, the development of this tool was really uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate how to integrate these two, um, these two sets of experiences in practice. And I think you'll see um, that it's resulted in, in, in some really good work. So with that, I'd like to turn um, to Federica Saliola and um, to take us through Thank you, Kelly, and good morning, everyone from DC. I also would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. We truly appreciate this opportunity to present the results of the EBA 2016 report and to get your feedback. I would like to begin our presentation by telling you a little bit about what has inspired uh, EBA. Um, we're all familiar with, I think, the uh, challenges that we expect to face, especially the ones related to feeding a world population of 9 billion of people, and the fact that these challenges uh, require policymakers to give more attention to food and agriculture sectors by making them more productive profitable and sustainable. The enabling environment is, uh, for the business of agriculture is a critical element to respond to evolving markets. However, understanding this environment is very challenging, given that many factors condition it, 
like policy, infrastructure, climate change, etc. And a lot of those factors are not fully investigated. Uh, EBA focuses on one important element of the enabling environment, which is policies and regulations, uh, and transaction costs related to complying with those policies and regulations. Um, so related to that, there are still a lot of uh, unclear elements related to even the role that policy and regulations play within you know, the enabling environment and the overall transformation uh, process. For example, you know, there, is no, um, there are not so many global data sets that compare across the world um, quality and regulations or the strength of institutions or the efficiency of administrative procedures. We still, uh, there is no clear uh, investigation or results about, you know, what is the relationship between laws and regulations and certain important outcomes, right, productivity of the agriculture sector or the transformation process, and more importantly, how do we define good regulations? Um, so EBA attempts to fill this gap by providing global benchmarks on the enabling environment for agribusiness and also to, um, you know, another goal is to trigger more research, again, on the role of laws and regulations um, in, in the context of agricultural transformation. As uh, Kelly mentioned, doing, um, the Doing Business Report has inspired um, EBA. For those of you who are not familiar with the Doing Business Report, let me just give you a few information about it. It's one of the four flagship reports of the World Bank Group. Um, it has been produced since 2003, and it, it measures the ease of doing business uh, across 189 economies, and the data are, collect, are collected every year. Um, no, two, doing business has many strengths. In fact, it has inspired more than 2,500 reforms uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, two very important uh, characteristics of that project that EBA has, has adopted are the actionability of the indicators, meaning that uh, all the indicators developed are under the sphere of control of policymakers. So they also capture laws, regulations, and transaction costs related to that. So for policymakers, it's been very easy to understand which areas need attention in terms of reforms. And, and also the comparability is, I think, the second characteristic that has made so far doing business such a powerful tool. Uh, and, and EBA also, uh, again, try, has attempted to replicate that by producing uh, comparable indicators across 60 countries. Um, let me also give you a little bit of information about the genesis and the timeline of EBA. Uh, EBA really started in 2012, uh, although data collection only began in 2013. Uh, we tested a number of indicators between 2013 and 2014 in 10 countries, and a report has been produced, and is actually available on our website. In 2014-2015, we scaled up data collection to 40 countries, and we were able to publish a second report in January, uh, January 28, uh, 2016, and we'll present in a few minutes the results of the, the most interesting results of that report. And at the moment, we're scaling up data collection to 60 countries, and a new report uh, will be published in January 2017. I would also like to acknowledge the support we received from uh, five donors, including USAID. The other four partners are DFID, uh, the Dutch, the Danes, and, and the Bill and Melinda, and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so EBA, uh, it's meant to be a tool for improved policymakers, and more than anything, an entry point for policy dialogue. Uh, EBA identified the most critical barriers for the business of agriculture, taking the standpoint of private sector companies. So the question is, looking at the agricultural value chain, uh, what, what are the major regulatory and policy bottlenecks for a company that wants to enter the market and run their operations in the market. Uh, not only we look at what is in the books, but we also look at the transaction costs that companies face when dealing with those regulations. For example, when we think about the seed sector or the seed registration process, not only we look at the regulatory framework 
around the, the, that process, but we also look at how many procedures a company has to go through, what is the overall time it takes to register a new seed variety, and what is the cost. Um, as I mentioned, EBA work, given this global nature, uh, aims to focus on very important, um, very important proxies that would trigger uh, more reforms and a policy dialogue, uh, more policy dialogue. Now, this slide uh, shows the number of topics uh, that are included in EBA. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's, it's pretty comprehensive, and that's another reason why we expect this project to trigger reforms. Uh, but let me clarify that uh, we uh, piloted six topics that are the topics at the top of the, of the slide that you are currently presenting, displaying. Uh, those topics are seed, fertilizer, machinery, finance, transport, and markets. Those topics were piloted in 2013-2014, so therefore they've been scored in the, uh, in the report that we just published in January, EBA 2016. The six topics at the bottom are still under development. So we, did, we tested the methodology for those six indicators last year when we scale up data collection to 40 countries. And we are planning to score some of them in the next the report that will be published in January, EBA 2017. Those are land, water, livestock, ICT, environmental sustainability, and gender. Uh, let me also clarify that uh, environmental sustainability and gender are kind of cross-topic uh, type of indicators, meaning that we don't have an indicator for environmental sustainability but we target environmental sustainability related aspects to land, to water, uh, seed and fertilizer, etc. And we, we won't go into details at now, but we have, we have some additional slides. So if later on you're interested in learning more about you know, what are the main elements of those indicators, who are the respondents, we'll be happy to, to present uh, more details. EBA, as I mentioned, um, is, is, is in the EBA 2016 report, we presented scores. Uh, but the scores are actually, they go in two different directions. So what we call the horizontal scores are the scores for each of the six topics that we measure. So for a country like you know, Burkina Faso, we, we can see how the country scores for machinery. And we'll present you a lot of results in a few minutes about uh, those scores. But because we think, you know, agriculture is, is so complex uh, that we decided also to have vertical scores, meaning that there are certain aspects that are across all the topics that we measure that are especially relevant for a company when they want to enter the market and run their operations. There are other aspects that are very important when we think of quality control aspects. Some others are all important or mainly important when a company wants to export or import, for example. So therefore, we also present um, scores by operations, quality control, and trade. And let me just, this is an example from our report. So you can see that a country like Mali or Niger, at the top, you can see the scores for you know, 56 on seed, 27.8 on machinery, but at the same time, you can see that Mali doesn't perform well on quality control. In fact, they have a score of 32.8. So it's very, it's more informative for policymakers, and more than anything, helps to focus on, on certain aspects uh, that are relevant for the enabling environment for agribusiness. Um, just very one important clarification: EBA does not advocate for deregulation. EBA is based on a concept of smart regulations, which is uh, consists in uh, advocating for eliminating unneeded step or burdensome procedures, making sure certain important safeguards are in place. Like when we investigate, for example, the fertilizer sector, we look at the process of registering fertilizers, of importing fertilizers. And, and country can easily compare how long it takes and what the good practices are. In some countries, it takes more than two years to register fertilizer. And that is clearly an impediment for, for companies to, to enter that market. But at the same time, we look at a lot of related elements uh, that have to do with the quality control. Like, for example, um, you know, the legislation in place for 
selling open bags of fertilizers or about labeling of fertilizers. And again, we'll, we'll provide you more details in a few minutes. Um, this this uh, slide um, presents the country coverage, the geographical coverage of EBA. Now, the countries listed in bold are the ones that we are adding this year. Uh, so the overall sample of 60 countries is there. So you can only find the countries that are not in bold in the report that we publish in January. Um, one, one thing I would like to mention, uh, it, it doesn't show uh, for some reason, but actually in India we are testing a subnational approach. So in India, not only we collect the data at the country level, but we also targeted uh, data collection in four states. Uh, because EBA, you know, it, we would like to test a, a, middle, a, a subnational approach because for a lot of elements that we measure, it, it probably matters where the company is located or where they're trying to register fertilizer, for example. Um, for certain aspects, it's just the national legislation that matters. But especially for time-related uh, aspects, uh, the, the state or, you know, the, again, the, the region where the process is handled may matter. So we'll, we'll test this approach in India. We've already been asked to test a similar approach in Russia, and we'll present the data in the next report. Um, our respondents come from both the public sector and the private sector. For the public sector, we mainly send our questionnaires to the Ministry of Agriculture, Transport, Environment, Central Bank, uh, State Inspector, Land Registries, or you know, cadastres, etc. For the private sector, we send our questionnaire to the most important players, uh, depending on the topic that we measure. So we have input companies like fertilizer, machinery, seed and irrigation. We also get responses from trucking companies, fight for orders, agriculture holding, lawyers, uh, commercial bankers, etc. I think I already mentioned very briefly the, the fact that we have two types of indicators. We, we just wanted to uh, present one more slide to make sure the methodology is actually clear. So EBA targets two types of indicators, the legal indicators and the procedures time and cost. Now, we use the word de jure and de facto just because the legal indicators have to do with the you know, regulations, legal text, decision. It, it's, uh, it basically targets legal uh, text in a broad version, in a broad, uh, from a you know, broad perspective, but it, it's basically what is in the books. Now, the procedures time and cost give us a, a, a good idea of about how efficient certain processes are and how costly for a private sector to comply with the legal and regulatory requirements. We, uh, this slide um, gives you an idea of how the, the scoring methodology works. Uh, this, this is an imaginary country. Uh, and it was just made up for, you know, again, just to explain the, the scoring approach of EBA. So let's, let's assume that this imaginary country has a fertilizer score of 53. Now, if this country adopts uh, good practices that are already in place in other African countries, um, could improve significantly its score. For example, if this country has a, a fertilizer catalog, but the fertilizer catalog is not available online, and, and you know, the, the change is made, they could add six points to their score. If there is a legislation in place about import permits, but let's say those import permits last one month, which is actually the case for a lot of African countries, uh, but that, that period is extended to 12 months, they could add three points. Or if there are no penalties for mislabeled, mislabeled bags in place in that country, and the reform is passed and, and, and those penalties are put in place, then the score could go up by additional five points. So by, by reforming those areas, they could improve from 53 to 67. Again, EBA is, 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 uh, should, should be seen as an entry point for policy dialogue. Uh, policymakers pay a lot of attention to, to com compare, to, of course, um, comparability. Uh, and it's also a good way to learn from other countries. Uh, we encourage a lot of peer-to-peer -peer exercises 
because in a lot a lot of countries, um, you know, they can just learn from their neighbors and see what good practices are in place in their country, and and they might, uh, you know, find a way to adopt the same good practices. Uh, it's also it's it's a way to self motivate uh, policymakers rather than imposing, um, you know, reforms or, or advices to them. Uh, this is just a snapshot from our website. All the data that we collect is publicly available. Uh, the, our website provides very detailed explanation of, for, of our methodology. Um, you know, you can compare countries, you can compare topics, and you can see all the reports that we publish, and you can also submit feedback and questions. With that, I will give the floor to my colleague Fabot for a presentation of some of some interesting results from EBA 2016 report. Thank you. Good morning to everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to be joining you all. Uh, re really delightful to see all your names and all the places that you're connecting from. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to present. Um, as Federica explained, we've uh, released our, our report, the 2016 report, early this year and thought it might be nice to give you a sense of, of the kinds of uh, data that we've gathered, the, the types of indicators we've put together, and the, the early results and findings that we have. Uh, at least we won't be able to go in much depth on this occasion, but at least we can give you a flavor of, of what uh, the direction that we're moving. Uh, in the slide in front of you, you'll see perhaps the, the first layer uh, or the first impression uh, of, of the results we've been able to collect. You can see that on this overview slide that in the rows uh, we have all the 40 countries that we covered in the last year's data collection, this year's report. And in the columns we have the six topics that we've been focusing on and scoring, initially scoring. Um, and we've given this um, imagery using colors. You can see that the greens in general represent areas where a country's regulation and the scoring for that, for that topic area is above the global average. And the reds, or pinks, illustrate the areas where countries' uh, regulatory framework is scored below the global average. Now, when you look at each of the rows in each of the countries, you'll find a small handful of, of countries that consistently perform above average uh, when it comes to their regulatory framework. So countries uh, such as Denmark, Spain, Poland, Colombia, and Greece, you'll see that they have these greens across all six topics. Then you find a small handful of countries uh, which actually consistently score below the global average. And here you have countries such as Niger, uh, Burundi, and uh, Myanmar. Um, but most other countries, pretty much all other countries, have a mix of, of, uh, of performances, where in some areas they perform above the global average, and in other areas below the global average. So for example, you'll notice that Bosnia and Herzegovina it combines very solid regulations for domestic plant protection and fertilizer, um, but it's combined with a lack of any framework related to credit unions or e-money. Morocco and Mozambique, for example, have poor or no regulation in agricultural finance, but they actually have very sound and solid provisions when it comes to the registration of new varieties. Uh, you also notice in these coloring codes that the darker greens and the darker reds uh, actually indicate where those countries are especially high performers or especially low performers because they're based on an absolute scale rather than on a relative scale. So this is really the first layer of our of our data. And if we move to the next slide, we can start looking at what happens at a regional level. Again, this is at the very surface, at the very superficial level, but it's always interesting to see these trends, perhaps expected trends, uh, where the OECD countries are the highest performers when it comes to their regulatory frameworks, followed by LAC, Latin America and the Caribbean, and ECA. Um, 
And, and then we find regions such as South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and East Asia and the Pacific lagging a little bit behind. Um, now, obviously, and as I mentioned, that is the first surface, uh, the first layer. When you start going into the regions, you see a variation uh, of performances. So if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, um, you see that Kenya and Tanzania actually perform above the global average in, uh, in, in their, in, across all topics. And this is primarily driven by good practices, regulatory good practices in the areas of machinery, agricultural machinery, and finance. And then you have countries such as Niger and Burundi, which in general at the global level are amongst the countries with the fewest uh, ag uh, regulatory good practices in agribusiness. I wanted to um, share this slide with you and refer back to the two types of indicators that Federica described. As she mentioned, we have these more theoretical, the Juda indicators, which look at, looks at what's in the books. And then we have the more practice-oriented indicators, which looks at uh, the number of steps and the time and the cost it takes to be able to comply with certain regulations to carry out certain administrative procedures. And so we've uh, put together this slide to begin referring to this fact that there can be a difference between what happens in the books and what happens in practice. Even though in no way are we measuring in exhaustive fashion what's happening in practice, but already what we do start measuring uh, can be contrasted with what can be found in the books. And here we see in this graph for example, switch. Uh, we see that uh, two regions, Latin America and let's say South Asia, actually score uh, very similarly when it comes to um, the registration of new varieties. Um, but whereas we can say that the regulatory framework um, behind the registration of varieties is similar in strength, the cost or the efficiency of the administrative procedure varies because it's much more expensive to register a variety in Latin America than it is in South Asia. So again, they might be at the same point in terms of same um, level in terms of scoring, in terms of the strength of their regulatory framework, in terms of their laws and regulations in the books, but then what happens in practice varies and it's expressed in the different costs for this specific administrative procedure. Um, this slide here uh, refers to, to one aspect we were interested in measuring or looking at through our data, which has to do with regulatory um, discrimination, right? Uh, discriminatory or non-discriminatory discriminatory laws or regulations that are in place, uh, initially against the private sector. So, we look across topics, for example, the eligibility of private companies to import machinery uh, or for the private sector to be able to register fertilizer or to produce breeder foundation seed or to be accredited to carry out seed certification. We look at some of these elements that discriminate against the private sector and their participation in the market. We also look at um, regulations that discriminate against foreign companies, so for example, the possibility for foreign companies to be able to import fertilizer or to be able to carry out transport activities within a country. And we also look at uh, discrimination or obstacles that are placed in, in the regulatory framework uh, for small players. So, for example, if there is a minimum capital requirement to start a farmer's cooperative or a minimum number of trucks to establish a um, trucking company. So we look at um, all the data points that have this component, this discriminatory or non-discriminatory component. And uh, we have a total, actually, of 18 in place, or 18 that could be found. And you can see in this slide that there are a few countries, one particularly where all of these 18 non-discriminatory regulations can be found, uh, several others where almost all of them could be found. But then on the other um, on the other side of this uh, spectra, we can see countries where a few of these or about a half of these 
non-discriminatory regulations are in place. If we talk about uh, Africa, for example, we see a country such as Zambia that has 17 of the 18 in place. But then, on the other hand, we have Ethiopia that has eight. Now, it's interesting to look at uh, what happens. I'm going to, uh, with your permission, refer much more to the case of Sub-Saharan Africa just to give you a, a sense of how this could be analyzed at a regional and at a national level. But obviously, um, the, the references that I make and the, the data that I, that I uh, cite could be applied or could be looked at in each of any of the regions or even in different income groups. But for example, when it comes to non-discriminatory regulations, cabotage, uh, which is basically the right for a foreign company to transport uh, agricultural products from one point in your country to another, that right is actually granted in only four of the 40 countries that we study. In Sub-Saharan Africa, where we uh, include 14 countries, none of the countries grant this right. So that's a uh, non-discriminatory regulation that's absent, highly absent. Uh, other examples of, of um, regulations of this type is, for example, that the private sector is enabled or can be accredited to carry out seed certification. Of the 40 countries we study, only 13 uh, allow the private sector to be accredited to, to do the seed certification, whereas in sub-Saharan Africa, less than half, six of the 14 countries. Um, Non-bank businesses being enabled, being allowed to issue e-money. That happens in, a, in about uh, half of the 40 countries that we study, 21 to be exact. And in Africa, of the 14 countries, only eight countries allow for that to take place. Now, in a very similar manner that we look at the, these, uh, these data points uh, around discrimination, we also look at data points around information. Uh, uh, basically, that allow for certain uh, databases or catalogs to be available uh, that uh, um, grant access to key information uh, sources. And we can see that in a, uh, in a total of 10 uh, good practices that we measure related to the access of information, there's a set of countries that have, again, uh, most of these in place. None of them have all of them in place and then a set of countries that barely have any. And you can notice that they're uh, primarily African. In fact, in Africa, of the 14 countries, all 14 countries have five or less of these good practices in place. And you can see that the bottom five have one or two in place. Um, at the global level, let me give you a few examples. Uh, perhaps one of the most absent good practices is the availability of a pest data pay, the database, a national dust pest database, which indicates pests that are in the country, what are their status, what is the condition. Only three of the 40 countries that we measure have this database in place. In sub-Saharan Africa, none of the countries offer this. Another element that we measure, we measure if there is a fertilizer catalog. That's one, one element that we measure. But there, we also measure whether this fertilizer catalog is online. Uh, so let's say 29 of the 40 countries have a fertilizer catalog, but only 14 of them have this fertilizer catalog online. In sub-Saharan Africa, seven of the 14 countries have a fertilizer catalog, but none of them have them available online. Uh, the, ability or the, uh, the channel of electronic applications for transport licenses in the 40 countries, only five countries allow for you to apply for a transport license electronically. In sub-Saharan Africa, only two countries, Uganda and Kenya, um, offer this good practice. And we could go on and on about these good practices that are absent or present. Now, um, we've already mentioned to the fact uh, that this is really meant to be a benchmarking tool. And in fact, in the early interactions that we've had with uh, different countries and governments, and um, there's an interest in quickly seeing how a country is performing in each of these areas against other countries. 
Uh, many times they're interested in neighboring countries, in the countries of the same region. At other times they're interested in countries uh, that are in other regions, but that perhaps they aspire to. I recall uh, not too long ago meeting with, with government representatives in Vietnam, and they were particularly keen on comparing themselves to countries such as Chile, Colombia, Turkey, uh, Philippines. So this graph that you see in front of you was prepared to offer that, that sort of benchmarking. But here I've put a, a, an example of Africa and perhaps comparing Mali to several African countries. And again, these are, uh, we look at the data really by layers. This is still a very early layer, but you can start saying that, for example, in, in fertilizer, Mali does uh, better than the others. Still has considerable room for improvement, but at least it can compare itself to several countries in the region and, and notice that it's doing uh, better. Um, but when it comes to machinery and markets, it pretty much lags behind the others and can draw lessons from them, and, and clearly lessons from other countries uh, that have strong regulatory frameworks in these areas. In areas such as seed and transport and finance, it does better than most other countries, but it still finds examples of stronger regulations in, in another country. For example, in seed, it finds examples in Mozambique. In transport and finance, it might look to Uganda to find some examples of regulatory good practices. Now, we could go topic by topic. Again, we can't be too exhaustive because of the time that we have available. But we would like to give you a, a sense or a flavor of what we look at within each topic, what we measure. Um, here on this slide, you can see how countries compare uh, to each other when it comes to their scores. When it comes to their scores on uh, seed, the seed sector. Um, Federica mentioned in an earlier slide that we have these 12 topic areas, but one thing that's important to notice is that each of these topic areas have subtopic areas uh, or subscores, which we call indicators. And so the score that you see for a topic is actually composed by two or three uh, topic, subtopic areas, which represent key issues within the topic area that we've decided to target. And these are key issues where we've, uh, based on consultations with experts, based on review of the literature, uh, we found that, that, that their uh, major obstacles can be found in these areas. So when it comes to seed, for example, the score is based on a subscore in seed and re variety registration, seed variety registration processes, and a subscore related to seed development and certification processes. Um, so I mentioned to this also so that when you see those bars, uh, you can immediately go a step further and see what they're, uh, what they're composed by. In fact, you'll notice in this chart that countries mostly score better on uh, seed development and certification indicators whereas seed registration, which is uh, those triangles, those dark triangles, proves more challenging. So you can see that the green circles, uh, in general, are at a higher level. But then this also means that if you look at a country, I've highlighted in this slide the African countries, just so that you see where they stand. Nine of these 14 countries uh, fall below the global average. But if you look at Burundi, which I've highlighted in red here, so clearly they have a uh, they have a uh, relatively low score when it comes to seed regulations, but then if you see the subcomponents, they actually perform relatively well in seed development and certification. Uh, if you compare to other countries, they're one of the higher performers, but they 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 perform distinctively low when it comes to seed registration, and the average is what gives it its its low score. I could go into the, some of the details. I won't go into too much details, but in the upcoming slides, I'll mention to some of the data points or some of the elements that we look into within this topic area. One of the elements that we look into is the variety release process. Um, the variety release committee is a key component of this process. 
Um, this committee approves the results of variety development and their, for example, the frequency with which they meet is a key element in, in measuring how efficient uh, or not they're, they're being in their performance. Um, you can see on the right side of this slide that there are certain countries, well, there are a few countries that don't have a committee in place. There are some that have a committee in place, but it doesn't meet or it doesn't meet with a required regularity. And there are other countries which demonstrate good practices. They meet on demand or they meet after each cropping season. Now, clearly, uh, the score for each of these varies depending on the frequency of their meetings. The, another element related, related to these committees is their, um, how they're composed. There are some committees that don't allow for or don't open to private sector participation. And there's plenty of evidence pointing to the fact that private sector participation in this committee increases the private sector's confidence, increases transparency, increases efficiency. Um, so you can see in this slide that a number of countries don't allow for public sector participation, in fact, 11 of them. And uh, the ones that do, some of them have less um, than half of the committee is composed by private sector, and some, the majority of the committee is composed by private sector. And here I've uh, included a few countries that fall within each category, just for the sake of illustration. And you can also see the countries where there is no committee, African countries where there is no committee or they're not meeting. Now, again, contrasting what happens in the books uh, or what can be measured in the books and what happens in practice, we can see here that uh, the cost of variety registration in some countries is uh, considerably high. And you look at a country such as Sudan, which actually has a, a quite a high s score when it comes to their laws and regulations on variety registration. They're um, the, amongst African countries, the third country uh, in terms of score. But then you look at the cost to, to register variety in this country, and it's uh, extraordinarily high. There are a few other countries that also have high costs and above their group, group average. Same thing when it comes to time of variety registration. Uh, you'll notice I've highlighted in this slide a few African countries. You'll see um, that Kenya, which is almost in the middle of the slide, and Tanzania have relatively short times for registration, under a year, actually. But then Kenya has a score of 94 for this specific indicator, and Tanzania for 56. So Kenya has much stronger regulations in the books, but when it comes to performance, when it comes to efficiency of administrative procedures, uh, actually the time to be able to register a variety is very similar. So now Sudan also has a score of 53, very similar to Tanzania, but registration time is much longer, almost two years. And Ghana, you can also see, uh, has a very high time for registering variety of 757 day, days. Another element that we measure within the seed, um, seed score is whether certification is required or not. And if it is required, if the public sector is accredited, can be accredited to carry out, there's plenty of evidence to, that points to the efficiency of allowing the private sector to be able to participate in this process. And here are some countries that have included um, fertilizer, another uh, topic area that we measure. Again, I've highlighted here uh, the African countries. 11 of the 14 countries that we study in Africa fall below the global average. And then um, if you look at the subcomponents or the indicators, we have fertilizer registration, we have fertilizer import, and fertilizer quality control. And there, be, can, there can be quite a difference uh, between the scores on each of these. Again, if you look at Kenya, you see that they actually do very well. Even though they're one of the lowest scoring countries in this topic area, they do uh, very well. Um, perhaps uh, the top performing country when it comes to the score on fertilizer import. But then when it comes to fertilizer registration, their score is, is uh, 
very low and pulls down the average score for the topic area. This, again, can be contrasted uh, against what happens in practice and the time that it takes to register fertilizer. Uh, you see, for example, Uganda and Ghana have the same score for fertilizer registration, 45 points, but there's quite a difference in the efficiency of the processes, where in Uganda it takes 691 days, almost two years, to register a variety, whereas in um, Ghana it takes 255 days, so uh, considerably under a year. But they both have the same score, so they have, have the same strength of laws and regulations in the books. Uh, we measure several elements related to quality control. One of them is the sale of open fertilizer bags, if it is prohibited or not. And in those countries where it is prohibited, if um, there's a penalty for the sale of open fertilizer bags and those are not. And here I've also in included uh, a number of countries which fall into each of the categories and therefore are scored in different ways. Machinery, another topic area that we measure. Um, nine of the 14 African countries fall below the global average. Interestingly, here, the uh, EAP region, East Asia and the Pacific region, uh, rank extraordinarily low. You see the bottom four scores are in that region. Uh, Philippines, however, which belongs to that region, is one of the top scoring countries. Again, you see the subcomponents of this, uh, of this score, tractor dealer requirement, tractor import requirements, and tractor standards and safety, and there can be quite a degree of variation between them. Um, it always has to be brought against what happens in practice, and we have, in this case, Sudan, that even though it has above an average score, uh, above the global average, 46 points, you can see that the cost of registering imported machinery is extraordinarily high. And a very similar case, even though the cost is lower in Uganda and Tanzania, a similar um, scenario can be found here. Um, I've just added this slide to refer to this other uh, element of quality control that we, standards and safety that we measure in machinery. It can't be found in uh, African countries. But uh, we, we see that the post-sales services required by law can be found in a small set of countries on different elements, uh, different aspects. And uh, we just wanted to highlight those. We do show these to countries so as to kind of see the improvements that can be made or the laws that could be implemented in these areas. Um, I'll let Federica continue on with other topic areas. So um, let me walk you through a few more results for the markets, finance, and transport topics. And then we'll, we'll open it for, for questions. Uh, regarding markets, uh, this slide actually shows, um, again, overall scores. And you can also see how you know, countries perform in terms of the two subcomponents. Just to remind you that for markets, um, we basically focus on two um, main, let's say, sub-indicators, one that has to do with production and sales, and the second one has to do with plant protection. Um, now, it is interesting to see that the countries with high scores, like, you know, Chile, Greece, Poland, Spain, also have less uh, divergence. In fact, you can see that the two components, the two sub-components have a very similar score. When we move to the right-hand side, we see that the countries that actually lag behind and also more divergent results. And this is in line with, uh, with a, a, a slide that Farbot, with the result that Farbot uh, showed a little earlier, where we actually observe that countries with smarter regulations in terms of operations uh, also tend to promote quality control. So it seems that there is a, politi a positive correlation, and the two are complementary rather than, than substitute. And, and, you know, we observe a similar uh, good and positive correlation here. Um, it, it, the countries that, just uh, again to give you a few additional information about this, the countries that actually lag behind are, you know, the common trends that we observe is that they don't have any um, regulated quarantine tests to allow this space 
feeder inspection, phytosanitary inspections, and, and, and so on. So there is, we observe, again, some common trends between the um, you know, low-income and high-income countries regarding markets. Um, next slide uh, presents you um, the an average time that it takes to obtain uh, pre-shipment export documents. And we divided the countries um, by income, income group. And you can see that um, it takes twice as much time to obtain documents in low uh, income and lower middle income than in, in high income countries. Um, in fact, um, you can see that uh, if you look at the right hand side of the slide, in countries like Denmark, Greece, Poland, and Spain, uh, it actually it takes no time. So you know you, you get the documents the same day you, you basically the companies request those pre-shipment documents. Uh, but it's also interesting to notice that within each group, we actually see significant variation in terms of time and also in terms of cost. So in terms of time, you can see that in the low income, definitely Tanzania has, you know, sh shows the highest um, number of days needed to obtain those, those documents. But then a country like Mali, for example, it only takes three days to obtain those documents. Same thing for lower middle income. Uh, countries where Zambia and Ghana, it's you know it seems it takes uh, eight and, and eleven days to obtain those documents, but then you know country like for example um, Guatemala, it takes just one day. So there is there is a, a definitely variation, and we could not add the cost information in this slide just not to clutter it too much. But also on that front, we we observe a lot of variation in. For example, in the case of Russian Federation, you can see that it takes 12 days, and the cost is only 0.3% of uh, the income per capita. But then if you look at a country like Laos, for example, it takes three days, but the cost is almost 10% of the income per capita to obtain those documents. Same thing in Zambia. 11 days to obtain the documents, but almost 11% of income per capita. So it's pretty costly. and. It could be an issue for you know mid, small and medium-sized companies when they would like to uh, to trade agricultural products. Uh, next uh, slide uh, sh shows the some results for the finance topic. Um, our finance topic is mainly focused on financial inclusion. Um, this slide uh, shows how in a lot of countries we find um, discriminative rules. Um, for uh, MFIs, clearly MFIs face uh, different risk. So having different require requirements, it is, uh, you know, uh, it, it is uh, understandable in a way. But in some cases, uh, we find that actually uh, those rules are too discriminative. Uh, that's the case of nine countries that you can see on the left hand side of, of the power of the of the slide. Sorry. Um, where you know, for example, Burkina Faso, where we have you know um, six uh, percentage point difference uh, in terms of the the capital requirements, for example, for MFIs, uh, or a country um, like Niger, uh, same thing. So in nine countries, it's really uh, it's too large, and in fact, uh, you know, MFIs struggle more to to be established. Uh, then in eight countries. They, the requirements are exactly the same, and in three countries, um, there is actually, you know, surprisingly, the requirements, uh, the capital requirements for uh, MFIs are actually lower than the one for commercial banks, which is also not a good practice because there is clearly a risk there for financial uh, instability. Just what the next slide shows you. Uh, the legal regulations on warehouse receipt. Now, warehouse receipts are very important, especially for farmers and smaller companies, because oftentimes they lack, uh, you know, the credit um, or at least you know traditional forms of collateral to access credit. So the warehouse receipts are usually a good alternative because they can enable farmers to use agricultural commodity as a collateral for loans, uh, but. Very surprising, we see that only in 15 countries uh, there are regulations in place for warehouse receipts, 
And in none of the African countries uh, mentioned, except for Ethiopia, Uganda, and Zambia, there, there are such, such type of regulations. Um, and this, the, our finance indicators are not measured for high-income countries. Again, given that the focus is on financial inclusion, we realize that uh, they were not applicable for high-income countries. Now, two more slides on transport. Um, the first one shows the licensing system across the 40 countries that we measure. Now, um, clearly the goal of, of you know, laws and regulation is to, or at least, you know, the main goal of, of a very efficient transport sector should be to have, you know, low price and reliable services. Now, because regulations can significantly impact competition, and especially the licensing system, EBA focus on measuring, again, what, what, is, what kind of licenses are required across the 40 countries. And, and we see that there, is, uh, there are a lot of differences across the, across the globe. In fact, we see that um, OECD income countries tend to have just company licenses, while in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, mainly track licenses. Now, um, the good practice um, based on, 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 on research is that company licenses should be should be in place as they can promote more formal and the professional transport services. Um, track licenses add another layer or, and do not control for the aspects that a company license could actually cover. So um, just to summarize, uh, we see that in 12 countries, uh, company license is requested. In 16, is the track license. In four countries, both licenses are required, which is clearly overwhelming for companies, and in eight countries are no licenses, which is not uh, considered good practice. Uh, one, one final slide on transport. Uh, it shows the, uh, how open countries are to international competition. So in our transport indicators, we basically look at uh, five different elements uh, or rights uh, that are granted to foreign companies, to foreign um, track operators, and, and we see how many countries have the five in place, or only one, or none of them. And uh, overall, you can see that the EU countries uh, demonstrate great, greater openness to competition from track operators from the largest agricultural partners. Uh, and the, you can see that the South Asia countries are probably the least open. In fact, uh, they only have uh, two or three of those elements that we measure in place. Um, but one, one result that was pretty striking to us is that the cabotage is only allowed in four countries. And cabotage is a right uh, that consists in allowing a, a foreign uh, truck operator to pick up goods from one location in the country and, and transport them to another location in the same country. Uh, and it's considered a, you know, a, a good sign of, of openness to competition because in, in that way the uh, truck operators of, of another country are granted exactly the same rights of uh, domestic truck operators. Um, and then I will leave, I will let Farbo present the last slide. Thank you. So naturally, um, the whole objective of this, of this work and of this product is to be able to facilitate it, that it be used in policy dialogue, in policy analysis, and ultimately in policy reform. So we have put this slide in to refer a bit to the engagement uh, that has led to this work and that is now also an outcome of this work. Uh, since the early days of the project, we've been very keen on uh, speaking with uh, stakeholders, involving stakeholders in the development of this project. Um, we've had plenty of engagements and interactions, not only at the project level, uh, but also at the topic level. So when it comes to seed, we've tried to identify key actors and key um, uh, experts and key organizations and companies in the discussions which help us to focus and refine our methodology. And, and uh, we've done the same for all the different topic areas. Now, engagement has naturally taken place with, uh, with government representatives. 
uh, to get an idea of where the needs are, where the challenges are, but also with other stakeholders such as civil society organizations, private sector representatives, um, development agency, academic experts. And so we have in the work that's led to this report, and we continue to, to, to uh, follow through with these engagements, hold meetings, interactions, webinars, exchanges, to make sure that we're collecting feedback and collecting uh, the experience of these different types of entities uh, so, so that it informs the development of our methodology. Now, at the same time, and especially with the release of the 2016 report, um, the, there has been uh, plenty of interest and reactions and uh, engagement around the data that we've been able to collect. And I do want to um, refer to a question that's been posed to us, so I'm uh, perhaps with the permission of the moderator already moving into that, into that section of our webinar here, about an uh, example of countries where the EBA report findings or recommendations have, have led to government changes in agricultural policy. So clearly our report was uh, released just a few months ago. It's now getting into the hands of, uh, of our audience, of our tar target audience. And we're starting to hold a series of meetings. And you see those dots uh, on the map of countries where we're holding um, some initial meetings and initial dissemination events. So clearly, uh, it will take some time before this information is uh, understood and is used and is applied and, and actually results in, in impact. What we can share at this early stage of dissemination is that the reactions have been uh, tremendously positive and very encouraging, I, I, I dare to say. Even where there are apprehensions about some of the data points that are measured or that are omitted in our measurements, uh, still the reaction is we want to do better on our scores. We want to perform well. We want to have higher scores. And there are already examples of countries uh, who are taking certain actions. For example, in, in, in one country, uh, the uh, Secretary of State has already put together a task force to study our work and see what actions can be taken place at the regulatory front to be able to increase their scores. Um, in another country, in, in fact, in Vietnam, they're in the midst of a, um, of a reform in their seed ordinance. And so as soon as these results were issued, we've been drawn into the conversations. And uh, we provided, that's our primary role, to provide the data necessary that helps them see what some of the areas that need to be strengthened in, in the seed ordinance. And uh, so we already see that it's informing the seed ordinance, that the new seed uh, ordinance that's going to be issued this coming summer. So as early as this coming summer, we could see some impact on, uh, on regulations. Um, but again, we're a very early stage. And uh, we, we look forward to, to the engagements that we're holding. As you know, it's one of the advantages of this project is it has its uh, its research component and the research team behind it. And it also has a very strong operational component, having a, a global practice of the World Bank involved. And um, many of our colleagues that are on the uh, forefront uh, of, of these operational conversations, of these policy discussions, are starting to embed our data in their conversations, starting to quote, uh, to, to cite our data, and use our data. So uh, we look forward to the impact that this will have in the upcoming months and, and years also. So with that, uh, we hope to have covered, uh, even if it's at a very quick, you know, I know it was relatively long, but it's, it's really just a layer of what we've done. And give the microphone back to our moderator for the questions and discussion. Well, thank you, Barbad and Federica, um, for the presentation. Um, I've um, I've followed the um, the dynamic um, engagement of, of many of you. We've captured uh, a lot of questions. Some of uh, a couple of which Barbad um, addressed uh, upon finishing the the formal part of the presentation. And I thought that um, before we um, 
before that I'd like to start with a couple of overarching questions. Um, these came in a little earlier in the presentation, and I, I want to um, turn back to Farbad and Federica just to provide uh, some additional background on the, on the tool so that, um, so that we can address these questions, and then we'll move on um, to, to some of the others that we received. So I'm going to uh, ask um, three questions. We'll answer those and then, and then move on. Um, there was a question that came in early uh, in, the, um, in the presentation related to how uh, the project handled gender. Um, that was something that uh, Federica shared. It's part of the project, but I think there's an interest in understanding a little bit more about how it's been considered from the beginning. There was also a question related to how often um, is the tool updated? Um, is, it for, um, is, this, is this tool for advocacy? Um, that, that came from Carrie Hubble um, Melgarejo. There's another overarching question that I'm going to, um, to direct to Federica and Farbad um, to answer is, um, is the possibility of accessing raw data. Um, and once we cover that, we'll, we'll go on. So um, turn, turning back to Federica and Farbad. Yes, uh, happy to start by uh, referring to the question on, on gender. Um, we, from the outset of the project, we were very clear that gender uh, was to be an important component of, of our work. And not only gender, I think this is equally applicable to the environmental sustainability one. Um, it was, we held discussions on these uh, from early on um, to see, again, what are the key issues, what are the key constraints, what are some of the regulations that have an impact on gender and environmental sustainability issues. However, um, if you haven't noticed already, we've wanted to be very um, careful and responsible in developing our indicators. And so that's why actually first in year one we had this pilot experience where uh, we measured a bunch of uh, different aspects and areas in, in 10 countries. We wanted to draw some lessons from that. And based on those lessons, we wanted to begin um, focusing on a few topic areas, uh, developing our methodology, testing our methodology. And that's why we selected early on to focus on those six um, core topic areas that we mentioned. However, the other topic areas and gender and environmental sustainability included have been at the forefront of our minds all along. Uh, we've been waiting to see how this uh, year two goes to understand better how to embed it. And now, in retrospect, I think, uh, I think it has been um, a wise decision because now that we have collected, we had the pilot year experience, we started scoring the six topic areas, we have a better feeling of how we can embed data points into the different topic areas um, to be able to issue and to share some more significant results um, on this topic area. And again, this is the same thing for, for environmental sustainability. And what you see, for example, in gender is that uh, we have data points embedded in for example, uh, land, the land topic area, uh, we look at uh, sex disaggregated data and registries and how um, we, we know that when data is presented in a sex disaggregated way, this has an impact on targets, on aims, and on participation of, of gender. And, and this is not only in, in land registries, but also water right registries and financial institutions and uh, cooperative registries. So that's one element that we look into. We also look at restrictions uh, to women's employment and activity. So for example, uh, are there restrictions to women driving trucks? So that's within our topic, the transport topic area. Are there restrictions to women producing or handling or using fertilizers, either organic or chemical? So that's in our fertilizer topic area. We're operating agricultural machinery in our machinery topic area. Um, we also look at another aspect we looked at is women's participation and, and also leadership in collective groups and cooperatives and associations. So you see, as a result, even though it was we wanted to tackle it early on, as a result of this work that we've been able to do to now, now we can embed it 
uh, much more effectively in those in those other topic areas. So um, you should probably expect in the next report some interesting results on, on that topic area and on environmental sustainability. Yeah, this is Federica here. Perhaps if I could just add to um, what Farbo just explained, how we developed our indicators. I also would like to mention that we've been working closely with another uh, group uh, within the World Bank um, that you might be familiar with. Uh, they've been producing a report uh, called Women, Business, and the Law. Uh, they've been uh, producing this report for the past eight years and leveraging uh, a number of reforms. You know, the main result that, that comes from that report is that actually business regulations are gender neutral. So they had to look into family law and the different uh, set of laws beyond the, the business regulation. So we partner up with them and make sure we don't duplicate our work, actually that we complement their work. And so that has, has, has clearly had an impact on, on the way we developed our indicators. Again, we try to leverage what data set. Uh, and we hope to come up with a comp more comprehensive, actually, analysis using the data that we produce and then they produce, and they will be published in, in for the first time in the report, and they will will be released in January next year. Um, perhaps I can address uh, the question about uh, how often the data is collected. So the EBA was is meant to be a three-year project, uh, three years that uh, have been used. We are, we are almost. Uh, close to the uh, to the end, to the third year, uh, to um, develop uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know our methodological approach. Um, as you can imagine, it's been very complex to develop those indicators across twelve topics for for agribusiness, especially compared to you know the indicators that doing business has developed so far. It's been a very complex and challenging exercise. So we we. Um, basically um, agreed with, with our donors to allow three years of, of, uh, as a first cycle of EBA in which we collect the data every single year. So again, we'll have uh, yearly reports, uh, two already published and one will be coming in January. Now, moving to the next phase of EBA, we still don't know how often and you know, if we will be collecting this data. Uh, we clearly are no, recognize the importance of monitoring progress, and not only because this is a great leverage for policymakers. Uh, if they implement a reform, they, they want to acknowledge, uh, they want that reform to be acknowledged and also the progress to be tracked. So it will be critical, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, to try to address those questions of what is the impact of laws and regulation on certain important outcomes like agricultural productivity or again agricultural transformation uh, and it, it, it is you know can we analyze the impact of those regulations without adding other elements into the picture and what are those other elements so you know we see the value of continuing um, collecting this this data uh, you know, regularly not only again to uh, motivate policy makers but also to better understand certain issues uh, with that say, though, uh, we really think that um, collecting data every year is not necessary for EBA, but rather every other year. Um, you know, those, those reforms don't take place every month, and it takes some time to see the impact of a reform in, in the agriculture and agribusiness sector. So that's a, a potential plan, but there is no decision um, has been made so far. Uh, in terms of accessing the raw data, so on our website we publish and we make available all the data points used for uh, scores. So if you look at our website uh, and you click on the scores, you can see that all the questions that have been, have been aggregated to obtain their scores are actually available. Now, uh, we collected more, more data, more data points, way more. Uh, and those data points are not published on our website, but we'll be happy to um, to provide those data points. Uh, there is a, a you can reach out to us uh, or just uh, put that request in our website, uh, and then we'll be happy to share this uh, this additional data. Some of them are not fully comparable. Some of them have been collected only for one year uh, because some of them 
you know, turn out to be not relevant or we didn't observe any variants across countries, but we'll be happy to share the full set of data that we collected um, if, if you're interested in requesting it. And I think, Kelly, I address, we addressed all the questions that you posed. Thank you, Frederick and Farbad. Um, just a quick time check. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes for question and answers before, um, before we'll wrap up. And um, there are a lot of uh, remaining questions. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, I, I'll direct a few more to Frederick and Farbad and ask that um, your responses be brief so that we can get through uh, some of these. There were a couple, there were a few questions related to um, uh, content um, of indicators. And, um, and I'm going to ask Farbad and Federica to, to kind of address these via um, chat. Um, but I'd like to um, have more of a discussion uh, about, um, about kind of some future-oriented uh, uh, discussion about how these scores um, will, what kind of effect these scores will have. We have a couple of questions um, related to that, one coming from um, Stephen Mink, another from Megan Murphy. Megan um, asked, Focusing on changing the score could pose some interesting dilemmas in terms of prioritization of reforms. Changing your score with one reform may or may not result in certain other goals for reform. In your discussions with governments, what other questions are coming up when prioritizing reforms for EBA? And I believe related is a question uh, that came in from Stephen Mink. As EBA adds countries, what is the increase in the number of people involved in doing the scoring? As this grows, how do you get consistency across scores? scorers, rather, so that there's stability across countries in time. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask Federica and Farba to, um, to respond to that. So this is, these, these questions are related to the evolution um, of the tool and how it's put um, into practice and used. Very good. We'll, we'll combine forces on such uh, good questions. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll address um, at least one of the aspects of this question. Um, clearly, what, what our methodology uh, attempts to do is uh, to highlight some priority areas, right? Uh, amongst the many things we could measure and the many things we could score, it's been the consultation that have led us, uh, consultations with evidence and consultations with experts, which has led us to, to targeting what are key regulatory good practices that are constraining uh, value chain uh, processes in a country. And so uh, in our discussions with, with governments, actually, um, one of the things, they, they're interested, obviously, in, in the full data set, what we, what we bring. And they're aware that this is a first stage of this data set. They're very much looking forward to next year's data set in which we'll plan to score uh, some of the more practical dimensions that we refer to in our presentation, in which we'll bring in a number of other topic areas that are going to be scored and issues related to gender and, and sustainability. Um, but even at this, at this early point when they see the data, first of all, um, they're, they're interested in prioritizing areas where they're below the average. So you remember that most countries uh, have some areas where they're stronger in and some countries that they're weaker in. And uh, clearly, those red dots um, do generate a reaction. And it's the first areas that governments want to look at and want to try to improve. And that is, in fact, the, the whole uh, objective of, of our methodology, of our system, is, is to be able to highlight uh, the, the areas where there's greatest room for improvement and the greatest need for improvement. And then uh, we actually, in the, in the discussions that take place, in those areas that are weak, weakest, we dig deeper. So we go into the specific data points. We share with them our scoring, what areas they score low in, what aspects are missing, uh, and which ones have the highest score or have the highest uh, impact on the score, the lowest impact on the score. And, uh, and those are the questions that come up that ultimately um, you can tell that in their thinking and their understanding our data, they're paying most attention to. So it's very interesting to see this kind of interface between our methodology and the objective of our methodology and the questions they raise 
and the uh, areas that they're starting to pay attention to based on, on uh, the data that we present to them. I would like to try to address um, um, Steve's question, uh, which is, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, so let me try to explain a little bit uh, how, how we're trying to, how we're proceeding and how we try to ensure stability. Um, so as, as I mentioned, uh, we gave ourselves three full years, almost four actually, to come up with a more stable methodology. Um, so why, you know, it's taking three years to, to finalize the scores and finalize the methodology? Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, every time we scale up data collection and we further tested our indicators, you know, there were some lessons learned. Since the very beginning, we tried to incorporate lessons learned from doing business colleagues, for example. Uh, but, but as we started EBA, we realized there was a completely different animal. So, so we actually, not only we paid a lot of attention to these lessons learned, but we also built on those. So in fact, you can see significant changes between the results from the pilot and the results for the uh, scale up to the 40 countries. And, and you know, we'll see more changes. Uh, in, 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 the, in the next report that we'll be publishing. In fact, um, last year we finalized data collection in July uh, 2015. And to come up with the new questionnaires, or, or the refined questionnaire, because we, we try to maintain some consistency ac across already you know, the, the pilot year and the second year and the third, it took almost uh, six months for us. So it was a, a very in-depth review. We uh, benefited from input from a lot of uh, relevant stakeholders, in, from World Bank colleagues, and, and you know from civil society, etc. So, so if, basically, in, in a nutshell, I would like to emphasize the importance of you know allowing enough time to come up with a, with a robust methodology. And robust means a lot of things for EBA. Not only robust from a technical standpoint, but again, we need to pay attention to how relevant is what we measure and. And you know there is no better way to test that than interacting with stakeholders and with policymakers, of course. Uh, but there are a lot, uh, two more aspects that I would like to mention that uh, are critical in, in keeping uh, in, in um, thinking about our timeline and how and if we get to a, a stable methodology. Um, we, to, in order to develop scores, we clearly needed to refer to internationally were accepted good practices. And for some of them, you know, there is a lot of evidence and research. For some of them, it took a lot of time for us because, you know, research is not there, evidence is not there. So we had to do a huge work of interaction with, you know, a lot of stakeholders, companies, policymakers, civil society, farmers association, etc. But for a lot of them, there are not good practices. And especially for the time and cost, uh, indicators. In fact, you know, if we ask ourselves the question, how long it should take to register new seed variety? Is it five days? It is, you know, 60 days? It is 600 days. So, so we don't know. In order for us to come up with uh, thresholds and be able to score those very important variables, uh, you know, we need a larger sample. So with a sample of, of uh, 60 countries this year, We'll do further analysis that we already did during the past two years, and and again try to build new evidence and come up with new good practices, uh, and and be able to score those very important time and cost dimensions. Now we cannot exclude the fact that moving forward, EBA will might need more revisions of the scoring methodology. Um, just as an example, doing business uh, went through three very important uh, refinement of the methodology. The last one happened during the past two years. And in fact, they had to include um, quality of regulations related aspects. And it was a big change, and you know, the scores uh, changed. But again, to the extent possible, keep into consideration all those challenges that we face, we believe that after the third year of EBA, we'll be able to maintain stability and, and compatibility across years. So we totally agree it is, it is very important for you know, policy making uh, purposes and, and again for research or, or you know, just uh, to, for
for analytical purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Federico and Farbad. The, the last question to Federico and Farbad and, um, it comes from Rosemary Nyoka, and she asks um, about, um, about how the macro level information that is generated through the EBA tool is linked to uh, grassroots smallholder farmers as a way of achieving an inclusive enabling environment in agriculture. Um, it, this could be this could lead to a lengthy response, but why don't why don't you give us your short answer and then we'll wrap up. Thank you for the opportunity to answer this question. Uh, I think it's, it's a very key question, um, and uh, in fact, that comment of of macro level levels is a, is a very good one. Uh, a lot of policymakers and um, and some of our colleagues in the different countries have commented that one of the greatest strengths of this work is that it kickstarts many discussions. It uh, it puts some issues on the table, and to the degree that it links with other um, data that exists, with other analyses that exist, it really uh, gives for a very uh, powerful analysis. Now. How can it be um, linked to the grassroots farmers, smallhold farmers? So one thing to be aware of is this is one of the complexities of agriculture and, and agribusiness, that we have a range not only of countries and conditions, of stages of our agricultural transformation, but also of, of the kinds of actors that we have in this. And we have the large uh, firms and corporations, uh, multinational and we have uh, small farmers and producers, and they all represent the private sector, and we want to make sure we're benefiting them all with uh, some of the regulations that we're looking at. And this is the case. We have made sure um, that we do cover uh, the range of, of uh, private sector actors. Um, in some topics, you'll find that, in fact, it's the smaller um, producers, the smaller actors, the smaller farmers, who are more targeted. Um, one example of that is our land indicators, which we haven't presented in this, in this case. You can see some references to it in our, in our report. Uh, but everything that has to do with inclusion, with um, uh, tenure rights, with transparency, with procedural safeguards in case of expropriations, I mean, all the elements that we're looking at have a very, uh, are highly relevant to smallholder farmers. Uh, same with, with markets. In markets, uh, as we mentioned earlier in our presentation, one of the aspects that we look at is cooperative action and contracting and being able to connect into uh, domestic uh, markets. So the, if you notice, the data points associated to that and the regulations that we measure are, are very relevant for smallholder farmers. Now, sure, there might be other areas uh, that target larger firms, uh, areas such as fertilizer and inputs, which require some of some bigger actors. Uh, but again, its aim is to ultimately um, uh, foster the availability of these inputs for the smallhold farmers. And there's plenty of evidence that says that by addressing some of these regulations, uh, accessibility is impacted. Um, so that's that's just, I mean, trying to stay within the, the time limits, that's, that's a quick overview of uh, of our work and its relevance to, to smallhold farmers. Thank you, Farbad. And again, thanks to both Farbad and Federica for um, the presentation and, um, and the, the thorough responses. Um, we've come to the end of the webinar. And it's, um, I want to thank everybody for your active participation. It's been exciting to see so much interest. I hope that it's sustained interest. Um, a couple of observations I made from following the chat. Seed systems is a big, it gets a lot of our attention. Um, I, it's interesting to see how this tool might inform policy dialogue um, around uh, changes in the enabling environment for seed systems in particular, among a number of other um, factors and topics that affect the work that we do in the agricultural sector in support of, of food security. 
Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to wrap up I, what, with a couple of other key takeaways. We've learned, and Federica mentioned this at the beginning of her presentation, that the EBA tool is, is really ju it's a starting point. Um, it's, it's, we already have seen how it's getting policymakers' attention. Um, it can generate momentum for reform, which is great. Um, but we need to make sure that um, we don't rush to um, that governments don't rush to address these sco these scores, and that the voices of citizens, private sector stakeholders, is not lost. I thought Tom Sanderson raised a really good point when he um, reminded us about the role of media, something that we can consider as we think about um, how these data generated within the EBA tool um, can inform policy dialogue. That's certainly our expectation, and I know we're eager to see how it, that's going to play out. Um, so, uh, so again, the EBA tool um, is um, it's a means of sparking um, policy dialogue. It's, it, I believe, will be effective at revealing the symptoms of a poor enabling environment. Um, but it doesn't diagnose the root causes of these symptoms. And I think that, um, that Federica and Farbad will also agree that, um, that to, to really get at, at an understanding of those root causes um, requires deeper qualitative analysis of political economy, institutional development, social dynamics. So, um, so excited that this tool can be a part of, um, of, that, um, of that process. And in conclusion, I wanted to note that um, that the Bureau for Food Security's Office of Market and Partnership um, Innovations um, is available to help. Um, in addition to, I know the EBA team who welcomes feedback and, um, and, and will be responsive to, to questions. Uh, the Feed the Future Enabling Environment for Food Security Project um, has, um, has also done in-depth analysis of the methodology and is available as a resource to brief missions and uh, field questions on aspects of the methodology. Um, they, can, uh, they can assist with understanding how to employ the EBA in the context of Feed the Future programming. Uh, they, they can also be a resource in facilitating stakeholder dialogue that could potentially be a complement to some of the outreach work that the EBA team has talked about here today. Um, so um, with that, um, we'll be sharing post-event resources within a week. And you can all expect to receive an email. Uh, uh, they will also be available um, on the event page on AgriLink. So again, thank you so much to everybody for, uh, for joining the webinar today and for your active participation.